This program shows drugs being made, sold, and used. It features graphic content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Concerned neighbors have made a 911 call. Nothing could prepare police for what they find. I think the individual uh, moved in here less than a month ago. This is the third overdose this weekend, so I would say that, yes, there's a lot of really good heroin going through the city of Portland right now. It's just another night in the overdose capital of the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Situated on the west coast of Northern Oregon, Portland is one of the greenest cities in the U.S. Its progressive attitudes have made it a mecca for America's homeless, who come in search of free handouts. You know, Portland's probably one of the better places for being homeless. And killer drugs. Well, the kids are here because it's the party. You don't get in trouble. There's nobody to tell you, don't do that. I gotta be free. A new generation of addicts is taking over the streets. Their custom is helping fund the deadliest drug market in the Pacific Northwest. If you don't have confidence within yourself, then you're just gonna, the streets are gonna eat you alive. Sparky left home at 12. She has lived on the streets since 2003. I actually started doing meth to stay awake because of the fact of waking up. And I was scared. For many of these homeless kids, meth is the drug of choice. I was up for 24 days once. I went to a psych ward. <laughs> Sparky has been living with her girlfriend under Morrison Bridge but they're desperate to move on. Basically, somebody tried to be a slick and drove off with everything we owned. Wait to get my hands on As two lone women, Sparky and her girlfriend are vulnerable to attacks. This time, they've had their sleeping bags stolen. Their only option is to walk the streets all night. For this, they need meth. But when you're homeless, finding somewhere to get high isn't always easy. Just the only place that you can actually get away with being in there for like a couple minutes without anybody seeing you. Actually, you don't really feel anything until like three hits, four hits. After five years of meth addiction, Sparky has built up a tolerance. At first, you get really big head rush. It makes you feel like you can do anything, you know? Like, Instead of only running for like three minutes, you can run for like an hour. You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. Meth users experience euphoria and increased energy. And then you get like a warm, fuzzy feeling all over. But it can also bring on intense paranoia. She's convinced they're being watched. We'll act like we went to the bathroom. Ready? I'm here. Afraid of getting busted, they grab their stuff and make a quick exit. Is there like a certain amount of time we're supposed to be in the bathroom or something? Well, what's going on in there? I was just got done changing clothes. Sparky's behavior is suspicious. It's drawn the attention of a park security officer. The thing is, is it's like there, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of negative things that go on there. Oh, well, yeah, every bathroom you can expect something like that. You guys have a place to bump down tonight or something? No. Concerned for their well being, the security officer chooses to help them out. Oh, thank Promise you. me that you will not spend it on booze or drugs. Five bucks on drugs, really? Sparky's been let off easy. With the cops, when it comes to regards to like drugs and getting busted, this is a piece of cake. If you guys don't think it's chill in Portland, then you're tripping. 
But in the face of a growing drug epidemic, Portland's relaxed attitudes are changing. Tension between law enforcement and the homeless has reached boiling point. The bumblebees are sent in to tackle the problem. Officers use mace to control the angry crowd. Once a friendly city, Portland now has violence spilling onto its streets. Local police are also cracking down on a drug problem that's gotten out of hand. So this is Pioneer Square, and this is where a lot of our addicts and dealers will hang out. The Street Crimes Unit is on patrol, keeping the city's drug hotspots under surveillance. Sometimes you'll see somebody walk through and head nod, and you'll see a group of people follow. So they'll go a couple of blocks where they think they haven't been seen um, and make the deal and then come right back and do it again. In downtown Portland, dealers are taking advantage of cheap public transportation. Drug hotspots have mushroomed along the MAX train line, where dealers make their deliveries to users. They panhandle here um, to make their money to get their drugs. So it's just pretty compact and convenient. The streets are full of repeat offenders. Cops and users are on familiar terms. How many times have I arrested you? <laughs> Enough so I know you, you know me. Oh, I can ask you for crap. Tequila and Brandon head to one of Portland's tourist spots, a famous donut shop. An informant has revealed that a notorious meth dealer lives in an apartment upstairs. So there's going to be a group on our left. They recognize the man. You see that? Yep. <laughs> An angry customer has seen the plainclothes unit and blows their cover. How you doing? Can I help you? No. Can you? Can I help you? Can I help you? They're a little bit unhappy with us right now um, because their dealers are not going to come down while we're here. Under the cops' watchful eyes, strung-out customers are led into the dealer's apartment. Customers continue to flood to the door. Tequila recognizes a regular. She uses mostly meth. Desperate for a fix, the customer yells up to the dealer's window. That girl, she's pissed at that chick because she yelled out his name. <laughs> With their cover blown, the officers are forced to change tactics. A second unit takes their place. Yeah, I'm watching right now at the same spot. More and more customers bang on the dealer's door, desperate for a fix. As the lure of easy money becomes too big for the dealer to ignore, the dealer steps out. He's walking the block. She's following. It looks like he's got a group of users following. Um, most likely, he's about to go around the corner and make the deal. Tequila and Brandon spot him in an alley nearby. In the middle of that little uh, eating area with a big old gaggle. The dealer and his customers use the tourists as cover. He'll come to and from his apartment, grabbing only what he needs, sell that amount, take the money back up. Heading back up to uh, third, with everybody in tow. Without seeing money change hands, the cops can't make an arrest. We can try to pick off one of the people that we saw walking with him, and we can actually get the drugs. We can you know, help us get in. Then, a stroke of luck. The second unit spot what looks like a deal. And he's going to his apartment. She's off northbound. I'm going to follow her. Brandon and Tequila fall in behind one of the customers. We're going to have to contact this girl. The girl crosses the street, forcing the officers to abandon their car and pursue her on foot. Stop! She doesn't get far as a cycle officer swoops in. Tequila is quick to search her. I haven't had any money. I haven't. I haven't bought anything all day. She has no drugs in her possession, but as a known drug user, they run a background check. You have a warrant. You have oh, a warrant. I do. Why? For what? Dangerous drugs. Okay. 
So I'm going to walk you over here to the car. The suspect failed to show up for treatment on a previous drug charge and has a warrant out for her arrest. So most likely she was buying from our target. Um, she gave him money. He went up to his apartment. I'm sure she was going to have instruction to meet him somewhere else. And obviously he didn't catch back up with her yet. Policing at this level is a frustrating process. It's not uncommon to make an arrest and, and book him into jail. And before we're even done doing our paperwork, they'll be out. You know, in hockey, when you get a penalty and you go to the penalty box, I think that's kind of what we do. We put them in the penalty box for their three minutes, and then they're back. The city's relaxed drug policy has left dealers free to roam the streets. For those with ambition, dealing in Portland is a business that rings off the hook. You have 2,375 new messages. I gotta call this dude, man. Hey, so what do you want me to do when I get there? Crystal Seed sells up to four ounces of meth a day. He used to be one of Portland's street kids. Now he's a big time meth dealer. He's on his way to meet his Mexican supplier in one of Portland's suburbs. Usually I wouldn't come out here at three in the morning. I just got a couple people that saw my ass about it right now. A meth deal of this size is always risky. My boy is smart. He doesn't sell nothing to nobody out here. So it's not like he's in his own backyard. In the meth game for over 10 years, Crystal Seed has seen the business transform. One of the best that I've ever done was always like, it looked like frozen apple juice. It's like Cooks here made it, and that's what it came out like. Because, you know, before that, it was way better. Portland had a booming industry based on local labs. Feds for the a ban on all the pseudoephedrine pills. And that just flipped the whole game upside down. In 2006, pseudoephedrine became prescription only. Without the key ingredient, the local meth industry disappeared overnight. And this opened the door for the cartels. And then once they took the pills away, it is all turned into Mexican cartel, cats running it. Mexican drug trafficking organizations linked to the Sinaloa and Knights Templar cartels have infiltrated Portland, monopolizing all supply lines into the city. You want to have a Mexican, that's what you call it. They're the best plugs, connections, whatever. All right, so yeah, I need to bounce out because I'm here to meet my guy. Dealers are easy targets for stick-up crews. Crystal C changes cars and location. He's using counter surveillance measures to avoid being tailed. From the finest grade A uncut Bombay meth. It's like big, clear pieces that the cookie cutter image of what you see in your mind when somebody said crystal. Users associate the crystal shape with purity and strength. For Crystal Seed, it doesn't compare to the homegrown Portland meth he used to get. Now, see, with the old dope, though, it would keep you up longer for more days. You'll see all these, like, just skeletons walk around just thinking they're the fastest on the planet. I don't really get weird off of it. didn't start getting the chicken around the room or nothing. With a decline in quality, Crystal Seed sells his dope cheap to keep the customers coming back. And this right here is about, um, I said it's a little over 16. Some people pay 80, 90 bucks for this. I usually charge about 60. There's cats that are working for me for days with their money because they know I'm going to give them a proper deal. I'm cut. He has no intention of climbing the drug ladder. The Mexicans have a tough rep. The higher you get, the further you fall. A lot of people want to be known as the guy with the bag. I don't give a about all that. I've watched the people like on a higher level than me. I've watched them all rotate and dropping my flies out, out here. The Mexican drug cartels have taken over, forcing cops in suburbia to up their game. Are we ready to rock and roll? Yep. Have we got the equipment? Yep.
just 12 miles from Portland across the Washington state line. The local task force is moving on to Mexican meth ring. This actually is a pretty dangerous operation. Most people that have their door come crashing in on them at 5.30 in the morning are going to be scared. We are going to be very, uh, very careful about any of these people that uh, arm themselves in a panic. The Drug Task Force has had this group of Mexicans under surveillance for 10 months. A hidden camera has filmed their every move. The kingpin of this local operation is a Mexican national. The ringleader is known as Juan, and his operation shifts hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of meth every month. He runs his crew of runners out of an auto body repair type business. All of his runners are Mexican nationals. Most are illegal immigrants. He's bringing up dope from Mexico. They're splitting it up, we believe, at these shops and then distributing it throughout the Portland, Vancouver area. Today, the cops are serving six warrants on six different locations. The aim, to cripple this massive drug ring in one fell swoop. Cartel members are usually heavily armed. Police have to secure the house fast. Hands out. Hands where I can see him now. Hands on your head. They catch one of the drug runners asleep, but they have no idea what's waiting for them upstairs. It's the police. Anybody upstairs, come down right now. It's a full house. With 12 family members downstairs, the house is clear. The two main targets are in cuffs. Commander Cook calls in the canine unit. This is just the start. There are five other stash locations to hit. We may find money, um, but more than anything, I think here we'll just find documents of identification. The canine zeroes in on something in the Kingpin's bedroom. Cash that's found in safe under our main target's uh, bedroom. From looking at it, there's probably at least probably 10 to 20,000 in there. In a nearby garden shed, officers make a disturbing discovery. With the walls spattered in blood, Bones and feathers are all that remain of the animals slaughtered on the sacrificial altar to Jesus Malverde. And then here we have uh, Jesus Malverde, patron saint of drug traffickers. Our head honcho here, our bad guy, uh, is wearing some jewelry around his neck with uh, Jesus Malverde's picture on it. So he's the, he's the real deal. Now they need to find the drugs to prove it. While one team searches the drug runner's houses, the other focuses on the distribution hub of the drug ring, which operates out of an auto body repair business. Well, we're hoping to find uh, dope in here because all the buys we've done, the dope has come from these shops directly out to the buy location, and then the runners come back to the shop. The workshop was also used to prepare cars for trafficking drugs. To access the trap in this vehicle, the driver needs to perform a series of steps. One, foot on the brake. Two, press the ignition to start the vehicle. Three, press the defrost button. Four, press the trigger inside the fuse box. Upon pressing the trigger, it releases the trap cover, which in this circumstance, happens to be the ventilation system. A three-hour search reveals other pieces of evidence. Down in this tire, there's an electronic scale. Very common in the uh, drug trafficking world. Not so common in the auto repair business. 
But the killer evidence comes from the drug runner's house just blocks away. This is the dope that was found at the other location. It was in a, uh, like a thermos container. A little over 40 ounces. The drug ring is smuggling its meth in a new and inventive way, in liquid form. It's a very simple process of putting the liquid form in some type of container and then adding acetone, and basically it hardens it up into rock. Using the runner's house as a conversion lab, the drug ring has the capacity to make multiple pounds of meth a week. The main stash is so well disguised, it takes days for the cops to hit the mother load. We get an accurate weight when we get back to the office, but roughly 10 pounds. It should be enough to put this kingpin behind bars for life. But it's no coincidence that the Mexicans are setting up across the state line in Washington. In the state of Washington, if he's an illegal alien and it's a nonviolent uh, drug offense, he's looking at a short trip to our state prison and then uh, just a deportation to uh, Mexico. Well. In that case, he's looking at really um, just a minor hiccup in his drug trafficking organization. Then uh, start at it again. With cartel members only facing deportation, the Portland area is a soft target and ripe for expansion. Using the same supply network established for meth, the Mexicans are now pushing a drug even more profitable and far more deadly, heroin. I'll tell you what, if I kill a junkie from an overdose, my name will blow up as a dealer and also way more dope. It's called gunpowder heroin. Gunpowder is relatively new. Scott is cooking up gunpowder, a type of heroin in high demand on the streets of Portland. The ingredients needed to make this can be found in Mexico, and Mexicans literally make this in their backyard. It is incredibly cheap. The Mexicans are using gunpowder to exploit an untapped market in Portland, pain pill addicts. People wanted the prescription pills, but they're super expensive. Those ran out. So where do you turn to? You turn to heroin. After a government crackdown in 2010, the supply of prescription pills dried up. The Mexicans seized the opportunity and flooded Portland with cheap and very potent heroin, creating a massive market for their deadly product. What we're gonna do is we're gonna turn two and a half grams into three and a half grams. By adding cut, Scott increases his profit. You're moving 200 bags of heroin a day. You know, you're doing about $4,000 worth of business a day, 50% of a profit, it adds up. It adds up. You don't need to be the kingpin of heroin to make a real nice living. As I use one ram of cut per every seven rams of dope. Although Scott cuts his heroin with sugar to bulk up his profits, his business tactics are anything but sweet. It's about letting them try your product because I got it so cheap, making my bags double the size of everybody else's, handing out free 20 bags. And when people do that to people who haven't used before, they know damn well they will repeatedly come back to you. Once they're hooked, Scott still has to keep reeling in the customers. When you do get this grainy, like kind of sandy look on your dope, a lot of junkies do like that. When you get it just right, it kind of blends into where you would never even know it was in there. And the only way you know it's in there is when you do it and you can taste it. <laughs> so, tastes like hair on to me. Mexican suppliers maintain a low profile by allowing local dealers like Scott to sell their product on the streets. If you are the drug dealer who has the good dough, has the steady connect and always has it, you are the And that all depends upon your Mexican. Your Mexican can make or break your empire. The Mexican's desire to stay off the police radar has allowed dealers like Scott 
to build up their own networks. But these empires are built on misery. I can tell you that the majority of my customers are homeless kids, spend between 50 to $200 a day on heroin. I need the homeless kids of Portland to support how I live. And I know I'm destroying people's lives. It's part of the job. While those in the drug trade are making a killing, it's Portland's young who are paying the ultimate price. We've both OD'd like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Not to the point of death, but we've both been in the hospital a fair amount of times because of it. You want to drive? Alan, here. I'm starting to get sick right now. I haven't done anything since last night at like three in the morning. You didn't save yours for the morning? No. My nose is just runny and I'm like sweaty. Ellen and Ethan are homeless and broke. They've borrowed a car to race across town to try to score some heroin. Finding money for drugs is a daily battle, but Ethan has a unique hustle to keep them well. A lot of what we get, Ethan, like, tattoos for, six to eight bags a day. But there's only one dealer willing to trade dope for tattoos. Ethan's desperate to reach him. You're re-upping right now? Where are you at? I can come pick you up to come back. He's a new kid on the block, so everybody wants to They meet him at busy Pioneer Square, where the dealer delivers by bike. It's the perfect cover for drug dealing. Yeah, we have enough gas, we should go somewhere cool. Ethan and Ellen drive to their favorite part of town to shoot up. This is the spot. The couple is part of the new generation of American addicts, hooked on heroin after abusing pills. I did a lot of pills, and then I moved up here, and I started doing heroin because it's way cheaper. They have shared their addiction and their drugs since meeting in rehab in 2010. This is called piggybacking. 80, I'm gonna split it to 40, so we both have 40. Years of drug use means Ellen's veins have collapsed, making them hard to hit. So Ethan does it for her. As the heroin rushes into her system, Ellen is released from her nausea and cold sweats. I know I'll feel better in a sec. Watch him take two seconds to hit. <clears throat> That's how you do that. It takes seconds for the heroin to flood Ethan's brain. We're just sitting here feeling better. With thousands of Portland's youth succumbing to heroin's powerful allure, local police have made it their number one priority to disrupt the flow into the city by smashing the local distribution networks. This group has been delivering heroin um, from Salem, Oregon, up to uh, the metro area around Portland. It's Sergeant Roberts' job to catch the elusive runners who deliver Mexican heroin to Portland street dealers. His team has been doing surveillance on a runner for six weeks. There they are right there. Today is the day they try to take him down. But first, the informant must lay a trap. Portland police set up a trap for a Mexican drug runner. Yeah. Hey, where do you want me to go, man? Come to Portland, Portland Oak. Portland Oak? Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. All right, you got, you got that for me, though? Yeah, 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 yeah. The informant orders two ounces of heroin. Now the drug squad has to follow the runner and catch him making the delivery. They're in Salem. Um, we're expecting that they're going to get on I-5 northbound to Portland to start doing their deliveries. 
Located on the I-5 corridor, heroin suppliers have established a major hub 46 miles south of Portland in Salem. A lot of these runners, they've come into the country illegally. They're looking for work, and I think in most cases, they're here legitimately trying to seek a better life. It's happened to a lot of these guys. Um, you know, in the bigger picture, the, the people who are moving larger supplies of heroin into Portland, they don't care about those guys any more than they care about the customers. If my runner gets taken off, no problem. I'll get another one tomorrow. The drug squad is hoping to take down the whole network by flipping the runner. But this is notoriously difficult. These mid and upper level guys, um, they understand that they're working for a cartel. If I rat on you, my family's going to get killed down in Mexico. They'll kill my, they'll kill my mom, they'll kill my wife, they'll kill my dad, they'll you know kill my kids, whatever. Working for the cartel is serious business. Runners are responsible for any drugs they lose. Today's target may be using counter surveillance. Four unmarked cop cars are following, but if the runner suspects anything. The whole operation could be blown. Well, we've got a couple other cars with them. We're going to kind of pass them by here for the moment. Something's aroused the runner's suspicions. He makes a last minute call to the informant. Where do you want me to go? Where are you now? I'm coming into downtown right now. Where do you want me to go? Well, I'm coming with you, buddy. They changed the location on us, so we're just basically resetting in the area where we expect them to arrive. Since we ordered up a larger quantity, they may be wanting to just to do it in what they feel is like a safer spot for them. With four undercover vehicles in pursuit, Sergeant Roberts moves to take a tactical position up ahead. They're going to be coming up the street right over here. All cars move in on the target. <laughs> the runner is quickly detained, but he's not alone. I have a code one cover car to northeast 32nd. You're under arrest for delivery of heroin, and we have a search warrant. OK. I understand. We're still at the top of the Droga. Oh, no. Okay. Police need evidence to dismantle this complex distribution network. We've got both suspects into custody. Both of them had heroin in their pants. Right now, we're talking with one of those suspects to see if he's going to be willing to give up his source of heroin. With no leads to go on, the cops need to flip them and fast before their bosses get suspicious. The second suspect we have in custody um, is telling us he's been selling drugs for one week. And he just started a week ago helping this other guy out. The younger man is just a trainee. He could be the weak link in the chain. He said, he, um, that dude is the guy that, with the contacts. He doesn't know the people or the phone numbers. Tú lo sabes en solo, pues. Sí, como quien dice, sí. Yo sé que tú no eres el mero. Eso yo sé. They need his cooperation to work their way up the ladder. Por eso te estoy dando la chance también. Te puedes ayudar si puedes llamar. The runner is too afraid to talk, and the officers have to look elsewhere for clues. A second unit is on standby to raid the runner's drug den in Salem. raid a Mexican drug den in Salem, Oregon. Although the house is empty, they find much needed evidence. It's about a piece of heroin. Probably about 25 grams. We've got packaging material all over the place. We've got some balloons, so they are packaging up into the smaller increments, the eighths, the sixteenths um, here. The vacuum seal is probably what it came in, came in ounces in that, and they just cut that right open and repackage it for how they need it. It's kind of nice evidence right off the bat. This shows that the runner isn't working alone. 
and the cops are on the right track to take down a bigger network. Found about an ounce of heroin, uh, a few thousand dollars, and then we've got some cell phones and other paper evidence, along with a whole bunch of drug packaging, a scale, just some of the tools of the trade. It's a good bust for the cops, but working their way up the supply chain is a slow process. The Mexicans are staying one step ahead, expanding into new markets. I'm in it for the cash because there is so much money to be made. It is disgusting. Lured by big money, 24-year-old Trey has skipped college to sell heroin full time. It took me about eight years to get this um, hook that I have. We on the streets call it the gold hook. This stuff right here um, that I got from my head honcho, who I basically work for, I'm doubling my money every time I sell one. Targeting the city's young population, Mexican suppliers are now using college kids to deal for them. And it's not just the cops you have to look out for, it's the, the business owners. You know, people seeing a hand-in-hand -hand shake, they're, you know, they're not oblivious, they know what's going on. Dealing out in the open means that Trey has to conceal his drugs carefully. The reason why I carry them in my mouth is because if I get stopped, um, I swallow them. Um, so therefore, uh, you know, the cop can stop me and I have nothing on me. And that's how they come wrapped, just in, you know, a balloon like that. At the first sign of trouble, Trey can swallow the heroin he's carrying. And that's why they're in plastic too and tied twice so they don't break in your stomach. Um, they just go through your system. You just, you just have a valve movement, they come right back up. You can pick it back up and resell it. But as demand for his product has soared, Trey's been forced to change the way he operates. What up, man? Yeah, what do you need? No, go to the Okay, and then I'll have my girl yell for your name, and she'll drop it down in the cigarette pack to you out the window, all right? Trey is taking a step back from street dealing. You see him? There you go. Come here. There you go. He wants the cash without the risk, and he's found an easy solution. I have runners, so I'm not out there in the public, and I'm not in the public eye. I give them uh, six at a time, uh, one for them to do, um, five for them to sell. Um, once they bring me back $100, um, then I give them another, another six. Trey's runners are college kids hooked on heroin. He saves money by paying them in dope. At the end of the night, that was in first place. It's just a little competition we have. Um, gets, gets paid you know, more at the end of the night. The more his runners push, the more profit he makes. But dealing to the young and inexperienced is risky. A lot of people tend to lie and glorify their usage. Oh, no, my habit's through the roof, bro. I can totally handle this. And that's just all a bunch of grown smoke up their ass. With my potent stuff, they go do a shot. Next thing you know, bam, they're back. Their eyes are rolling the back of their head. The lips are turning blue. And those are the couple signs of ODs. Trey is pragmatic about customer care. Here is something that I think all drug dealers should have. These are um, injectable naloxone. It's what the um, hospital gives you when you OD. They pump it in into your system and brings you right out and puts you into complete sickness. Keeping customers alive guarantees repeat business. I've known friends that are now in prison because selling dope to someone who dies, that person can get charged with manslaughter and end up doing some years. Trey wants to stay out of jail, but he's hooked on the profit. The cash, the control, the power, the want that people uh, need what I have, I'm addicted to the hustle. Heroin turns dealers into merciless profit hunters who prey on the weakness of others to turn a fast buck. But for those on the street, escape isn't easy. So, not feeling too good. I'm sorry, just a sec. Nervous. 
6.30 a.m., Ellen and Ethan have been able to afford a motel room for the night. I am this morning trying to get into detox, hoping that I'm number one on the wait list and that I'm getting in today. To get into detox, Ellen can't have opiates in her system, but there are other options. That's Adderall and um, some sleeping pills like Trazodone, just some stuff to ward off like feeling sick. A cocktail of uppers and downers are keeping her together, barely. Um. And the worst of withdrawal is yet to come. Being dope sick is like the worst flu you've ever had times like a thousand. You know, junkies do anything to avoid it because being dope sick is just like hell. I'm still trying to get into detox also. So I'm still in limbo and I'll continue to be in limbo if she gets in. Demand is high for beds at detox centers. So Ethan has to wait his turn alone. 7.02, we gotta go. It could be six months before they are together again. I'll call you if I can. If I get in, we'll see. Ethan will have to deal with his addiction on his own. His future is uncertain. If you want to get clean here, there's lots of ways to do it. Depends on how bad you want it and getting your together and getting up the balls to actually do it. Ellen has faced death too many times. She's desperate to get out. This is her seventh time in detox. The only way for me to get clean is to lock myself in a facility. Treatment is the first step in a long and painful recovery process. Leaving the streets doesn't guarantee an escape from addiction. Those in recovery are often those most at risk. Meanwhile, on Portland streets, the cops continue to pick up the pieces. It's 1.40 in the morning, and uh, we got a call about 45 minutes ago on uh, expected overdose in downtown Portland at an apartment building. Sergeant Roberts has been called to a suspected OD at a building that offers housing to recovering addicts. This little bit of evidence we gathered from the room upstairs. It's his needles, his cooker, it's brown, um, where he cooked the heroin up before he shot it. For those whose recovery fails, the risks are even greater. They go off the heroin, they've been clean for a while, they go back onto the heroin, and when they go back, they take the same dosage that they were taking when they were on heroin. When they use that same amount, their body's not used to it because they've been clean for a while, and they overdose. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, and a guy who's 32 years old is dead because he used heroin last night. I want to hold people accountable for making their money off the backs of people who are addicted. As the war between cops and dealers escalates, the number of young casualties is on the rise. Portland City services are being stretched to the limit. Out in the street, there are people, they're dying, they're on trail, and crying, oh Lord.